good evening everyone uh, welcome to the 16th chapter uh, in the second series of master classes brought to you by the academic council of iso uh, the topic for today is hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes uh, i invite uh, our secretary of iso dr chandra mohan to kindly uh, deliver the welcome address thank you dr sijan am i audible yes sir yeah in fact it's a pleasant surprise for me to kick start this program uh, not only because you are running in it in a very excellent way uh, but also because the hereditary colorectal cancer is a topic which i hold to my heart very dear and near this hap uh, this hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome is something which is uh, not very much diagnosed and treated uh, in our country because of the varying uh, the health care priorities uh, but uh, since i started working in institute for last 20 years and many of uh, we have a huge colorectal cancer workload and uh, we used to ignore uh, the family history in the beginning but now i am little worried when uh, the relatives the brothers sons of the people i treated long back are coming back with the uh, uh, colorectal cancers so it, it's actually uh, i am little uh, ashamed that you know we should have counseled them in the beginning itself anyway whatever done is done now we can't uh, afford to lose out such a sector of patients in which we can prevent the cancer by doing the appropriate manners and uh, the recent inclusion of the microsatellite instability check check up for uh, planning adjun has brought up a significant number of patients who are uh, likely to have hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome and uh, i think this is one of the need of the hour because we have a huge number of population uh, colorectal cancers in fact colorectal cancer is number 4 cancer in kerala as well as in many part of india and so we are going to get a huge number of families who are having the risk of colorectal cancer i hope that you know, today's case presentation as well as the discussion will throw a light on this issue and uh, we can have a better better ideas and practice guidelines after this i thank dr anil heru and i invite anil heru sandeep kaul and sandeep patra as well as the our candidates for this uh, today's program uh, i uh, uh, welcome you all thank you very much thank you dr chandra mohan uh, the faculty for today is uh, the moderator shall, role shall be played by dr anil heru who is the head of surgical oncology at fortis hospital mumbai uh our two examiners for today are dr sandeep call who's a consultant colorectal surgeon uh from bromford uk and he be shortly joined by dr sandeep patra who's the director of medical oncology at max super speciality hospital sakit uh the examinees for today are dr charan singh who's a resident in department of surgical oncology at kirwai memorial institute of Onc uh, oncology bangalore and uh, dr rajendra bai shetty who's a resident in surgical oncology at aims jodhpur a uh, few uh, basic instructions for uh, this first session uh, the first one hour will be a mock examination for our examinees uh, we uh, request you to give to the point answers to the questions being asked uh, even if you don't know something you can just mention that and uh, we can move forward uh, it's up to you to you know catch the hints that our examiners keep giving for our moderator dr anil hirur uh, we request you to please address the examinee by their name to avoid confusion as to whom should be uh, answering the question and we request you to ensure that both the examinees get equal opportunity to the examiners in interest of uh, the online viewers uh, as well as the viewers who are watching this uh, on social media later uh we request you to give the expected answers to the questions that remain unanswered or have been incorrectly answered by them uh this is unlike in an exam uh for the other participants who are online for the senior iso members uh, thank you for uh, logging in and please post in your inputs as well uh for the residents this is a unique opportunity to clear all your doubts from uh you know, seasoned clinicians uh for the time keeping part i'll be reminding the moderator and examiners on chat at 45 minutes and the end at the end of case discussion which would be one hour uh i invite our moderator dr anil hero to kindly proceed uh dr batra uh, is having some problem logging in and i am uh, in contact with him to get him online till that uh, uh till he joins in i request dr sandeep uh, call and dr hero to please proceed 
uh, yeah thank you thank you shrijan and uh, uh, thank you iso and uh, congratulations on doing uh, continuing this excellent masterclass series uh, it's really wonderful attending it's a great revision for all those who are practicing as well as a uh, great uh, preparation for uh, for residents and i'm glad you have taken this topic as dr chandramohan rightly said this is a this is a topic which is you know uh, this is like those dark family secrets everyone has it nobody wants to speak about it until you really come to confront it when you don't know what to do uh, and uh, as uh, we are seeing more and more cases extremely relevant and i'm glad that we have uh, very good uh, examiners here who will uh, enlighten us and i hope dr rajendra and dr charan singh are ready to uh, ready to start uh, so should we start dr yes, rajendra yes sir dr charan good today is raksha bandhan and i think you will read all those rakhis on you so <laughs> so let's get started so my first uh, case here this was a 34 year old female she had altered bowel habits malina with right lower abdominal pain since 2 months and the symptoms had become progressively worse she is a known case of hypertension in her uh, uh, comorbidities and hypothyroidism on inquiry she had a family history which said of colonic cancer in her father paternal uncle and endometrial cancer in her paternal aunt uh, she is married uh, with two kids physical examination was absolutely normal anything more would you like to know in history dr rajendra uh, yes sir so first uh, i would like to uh, elaborate the complaints what she is uh, giving that is altered bowel habits so that uh, altered bowel habits can be either constipation or uh, this was she had uh, repeated episodes of loose stools okay so uh, Uh, yes sir so uh, repeated episode loose stools so uh, elaborating of the lo uh, loose stools the frequency of the loose stools and uh, uh, is a uh, consistency a uh, consistency and frequency and whether it is associated with uh, blood or not so the uh, she had melina so she has melina um, yes sir so Uh, melina and uh, uh, right lower abdominal pain also so the pain elaborating uh, the pain so that type of uh, type of pain and uh, the na nature of the pain whether the pain is referring to back or not and whether any aggravating or relieving symptom uh, uh, aggravating and relieving factors are there for the pain i would like to know sir and along with that the other history uh, to uh, differentiate uh, other uh, differential diagnosis Uh, such as any uh, history of tb uh, uh, history of tb or uh, tb contact prior history of tb medication or any cough with expectoration and uh, so other oh, history sir so basically i think uh, if we focus on the, the uh, on the uh, current case scenario i will focus on the colonic genetic part so no history of tuberculosis the pain was intermittent colicky Uh, you got relieved on its own uh, anything else in family history would you like to know dr charan would you point to anything so so what your dr anil is trying to point to you is that this is a pro band the, what are the things that you want to ask in that history so the age of colonic cancer in the father age of paternal uncle age of cancer in the paternal aunt so he is basically asking you to somehow find your way through uh, the criteria which will classify this syndrome dr anil black to you sir absolutely dr. yes uh, we just want to welcome dr batra yeah thank you dr paul and dr arun actually i was there as a panelist since 7 pm i heard the talks you had before the start of meeting some i was promoted to a panelist right now so i've heard a history a brief history which is on the screen and some questions counter questions by the exam let's continue and probably i should be able to uh, wonderful pitch it welcome dr batra thank you yeah thank you sir thank you yeah so dr charan uh, as dr uh, mr kaul has just pointed out so uh, tell me you are muted i think dr charan you are muted
can't hear you. Can't hear you. Dr. Rajendra, till the time Dr. Hello, Chalana, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, by seeing the family history, I am suspecting the hereditary cancer syndrome. So, so I want to see whether this criteria fitting into Amsterdam criteria 2 are uh, revised to Bethesda guidelines. So, according to that, uh, I want to uh, know the age of the persons who are affected in the family and uh, other uh, synchron uh, other uh, extra colonic malignancies, anything is there in the family history, I want to know, sir. So, uh, so that's exactly what I was pointing out. So, I think we, when you are uh, dealing with this kind of family history, that is what you should also know, the age of uh, onset of cancer in each of the if they remember. Now, for example, this lady uh, told me that her father was affected at a young age. As is usual, she, she did not know the exact age, but I assume that it was probably below the age of 50. Uh, and endometrial cancer in the paternal aunt. That was That is all that we could elicit. That's why I, I have not really written it here. Anything else, Dr. Batra or Dr. Kaul, you want to ask the examinees on this brief history? I, I believe that personal history has also been including in this history. So exam yes. examinees did not ask about any personal history of a cancer because we are right now dealing with a very short history of two months. Yes. She's 34 female. Any history of other cancers like ovarian, breast, uh, anything else, any any sort of uh, uh, mucocutaneous tumors, skin tumors. So you have to ask that in the, in the personal history as well. So this was the one thing I would suggest examinees whenever they are suspecting a familial cancer syndrome, not only the family, but the personal history of the patient, including the past illnesses, also becomes important. Okay. So Dr. all I would add is that all I, if you if you can if you can sum this up in one sentence is you can tell your examiner that sir, I will create a pedigree chart. The moment you say these three lines, the three words, I'll create a pedigree chart, and I will do proband examination. And as Dr. Batra said, personal history is very pertinent. So especially if you're dealing with something, so Dr. Anil has already pointed you to the way, to the way of, nearly pointed you to the way of Lynch. He's already done that in one slide. And I must establish here that in an exam, the first three, four minutes that you have, you have to display at what level you want to be examined. So in the first slide, you can basically tell the examiner that I have done the basics. I have passed the exam. Can you please challenge me? And that is the way we should go forward. Thank you. Sir. Okay. So Dr. Charan, anything, any investigations? What are the investigations you would do? Just brief main investigations that you would like to do in this patient. Uh, sir, like uh, history of melina is there, so I will go to with the colonoscopy as the investigation of choice, sir. Along with that, uh, routine blood investigation, like she can also have anemia. So we'll do routine blood investigation, including SB. And uh, so, Dr. Charan, uh, with the history of Melina, your preferred scopy would be a upper GI endoscopy or a colonoscopy? What do you think uh, is the cause of Melina? Uh, sir, um, it can be both, sir. Upper GI and uh, endoscopy is also included if any. Oh, no, yeah. when does the blood manifest as a fresh blood in the stool and when does it present as a melina? So what is the like, differentiating feature? Uh, upper J bleed melina is uh, more uh, like a uh, bleed is uh, before the ligament of trees. Is there. So your statement yeah. that with the history of melina, I would like to go for colonoscopy. Uh, I would say that don't stress that particular part of the things, but otherwise you will lead the examiner to ask why not a upper J endoscopy. Only when the blood comes in contact with the acid, it can, gets converted into melina, not otherwise. So please don't uh, utter the words which can confuse someone. So exactly. you have altered bowel habits. So melina, uh, uh, it could be because patient may also have something in the upper GI, but since altered bowel habit, pain, lower abdomen, they are leading towards something in the larger bowel as compared to the upper GI, gastrointestinal tract. So give that particular point for uh, deciding the which type of scope you have to do. Yes, sir. 
So I think what uh, Dr. Batra is saying that don't ju just because we are discussing this, we are we should not jump to upper GI scopy straight away, uh, lower GI scopy. Right, right. We should think about upper GI scopy because that Malina word is uh, is something that points out to some something happening in the upper GI as well. It should highlight things. On the contrary, if you start with basic yeah. investigations, I would possibly look at the hemoglobin. I would look at the iron studies. I would want to make. Sh I, I, I would want to do the due diligence. You are going to need your renal function test. You are going to do a colonoscopy for bowel prep. You do not want to drive your renal functions down. And especially if this patient has, for example, if it was not a Lynch and was a desmoid and had some, uh, had some uh, uh, ureteric pathology, we would be in trouble uh, giving uh, a bowel prep to a patient with an EGFR of twenty eight. So due diligence is always required. So Dr. Rajendra, can you again sum up the investigations that you would do? And then we will just, we'll just move forward. Yes, sir. Uh, upper GI endoscopy and colonoscopy and uh, CECT thorax abdomen, sir. Which I would like to do. And uh, followed by, uh, so colonoscopy biopsy, the biopsy sample I would like to send for the, uh, this one, sir. Um, MMR, IHC markers and genetic panel also, I would like to send. Rainder, you have yet not established the diagnosis and you have diagnosis and you have moved straight forward to IHC, MMR and other panels. You, uh, a genetic panel, that is a bit too much there. Without establishing that you have cancer at all. Why are you doing a CT cap? Forget about genetic panel. Sir, uh, after confirming biopsy only, uh, so, okay. I would like so to you are going to do a colonoscopy and you are going to wait for Dr. Anil to tell you your findings. Okay, sir. Okay. No CEA? Yes, sir. Serum CEA also. So, don't forget all these basic things, okay? You need a base, if at all, now once you are, that is also after the diagnosis, right? Sir. So, this was the CT finding. There was just thickening in the, uh, in the ascending colon. And uh, the colonoscopy, the upper GI scopy was uh, normal. The, the colonoscopy showed ascending colon, the mass, biopsy, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. And the CA level was then done, which was 5.2. Now what? Any, qu any que questions from the examiners? What, what would you want to ask? Dr. I think uh, based on these colonoscopy findings, obviously the examinees would be interested in knowing uh, the biopsy and biopsy is already there. You have already done part of this staging workup uh, with the CT of the chest also. So I don't think uh, beyond this information, we have a working diagnosis. Anything the examinees would be specifically interested in. We have already mentioned it's categorically moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcin. Anything else in the biopsy, uh, Dr. Charan or Dr. Ayanda, you would like to know? Any specific things in the biopsy or only um, moderately different adenocarcinoma will suffice? Any, any signaling uh, or uh, mucinous uh, component is there or not, sir? Mm -hmm. And uh, grade of differentiation, uh, like it is moderate differentiation. It's already there. Along with that, uh, tumor uh, lymphocytes, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and uh, lymphoid reaction in the biopsy, we can see. So if it, these are features suggestive of... Uh, uh, and LVI also. Like Lynch syndrome. So basically the high risk features uh, I would like to see, that is the grade, uh, LVI and other, uh, this one, mucinous and signet cell, uh, signet cell cytology. Would you like to do... Um... Would you now like to do MMR testing on this? Yes. Yes, sir. So biopsy is confirmed. Uh, so why? I would like to send. Is biopsy is confirmed cancer. Yes, sir. So, so are you planning uh, MMR testing or not planning MMR testing? Yes, sir. So within the biopsy only. So the I would like to request for the IHC for MMR proteins. Okay. So uh, if there we take the reason why, sir. Is there a reason why you're requesting the MMR now and now not on the main specimen? How is it changing your management? Sir, uh, th that, uh, that shows uh, any pathological variant, which is uh, any mutation is there. So which is running in the family. 
So, for example, like if MLH LH one protein deficient is there, so that can be a sporadic or that can be uh, familial. So, to differentiate the two mainly. So, if it is familial is there, so the further uh, surgery plan will be different. How would the surgery plan be different? Okay. Uh, uh, before that, uh, we have, if we take the biopsy at the face value, you don't have any of the features that are usually associated with the Lynch syndrome. Still, you would like to go ahead with the uh, molecular testing at this point of time? Yes, sir. Uh, no, universally, uh, universal screening is advised uh, for um, all patients. And uh, Dr. Kowal mm -hmm. asked one pertinent question, uh, which I think you have not completely given the answer. Why do you want to do it in this biopsy specimen? Why not wait for the whole specimen? If one is planning surgery for this patient, yeah. synchronous malignancy can be the there, sir. In the synchronous malignancy has not been put. You are you are raising a finger at the gastroenterologist. Your gastroenterologist will not like you. Basically, you have proven in a, uh, your colonoscopy that there is an ascending colon growth. The, there is yeah. no other growth elsewhere. How is yeah. it changing your surgical management? You have asked for a test that will take a few days. You have delayed and deferred surgery, right? How is, going, how is it going to change your management? In a 34-year-old patient who has presented... Like uh, the, if she has completed okay. the family cell, if, uh, like endometrial, and uh, she came out uh, MMR positive with the MSI I, so Lynch syndrome will stabilize and we can do the TH, BSO along with the primary surgery as a risk-reducing surgery for the patients. Dr. Charan, you are putting yourself into a trap. Okay, so so I have not I have not digressed from colon yet. I am I am still on colon. I have not digressed. What I am asking you to say is basically that what surgery are you going to do? Yes, sir. What are you going to do for this patient who has a ascending colon growth? Yeah, yes, sir. If MMR mutation is there, then we have to do total. What surgery are you going to do? Right the... hemicolectomy. Okay, so so Rajinder has Rajinder has committed that he is going to do a right hemicolectomy. He has committed to do a right hemicolectomy after requesting MMR. So I tell you that the MMR has now been reported as deficient MMR, MSI H. No MLH1 hypermethylation seen and BRAF mutation negative. What is happening there? So you are still is... going to do a right hemi, right? Why? No, sir. Uh, if that is MSI H is there, uh, so total colectomy with iliorectal uh, anastomosis is advised. In. So then why did you why did you ask for the MMR in the first place? It so is just... important that you ask for the MMR, this... but then you utilize the decision from that to to plan your treatment. There is an argument against that also, uh, provided the patient is ready to accept that, but you have to discuss those things. So what Dr. Anil has just told you is, he wants you to discuss with your patient that their 34 year old female, will you want a right hemicolectomy with these advantages? Would you like a total colectomy with IRA? With this disadvantage, what are you doing? What is your what is your uh, daily routine? Will you be able to open your valves six times a day? And is that okay with you? No, sir. So bowel frequency is more. So some patients uh, may not accept for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I'll allow doctor. Oh, doctor, what Mr. Call is actually trying to point out is that genetic testing cannot be taken lightly and you will have to take a proper consent counseling before going ahead with surgery. There are implications of genetic testing that we have to realize. Yes, sir. So, ethical issues. There are a lot of, and these are, these are decisions that when you sit in your outpatient clinic, will go beyond the, just the primary patient and will go beyond to the family as well. Plus, there is a time gap for uh, for the test results to arrive. Exactly. Let's proceed, doctor. Okay. Uh, Nothing else on this. So, as it turns out that uh, she uh, went ahead with surgery. This was the this was a lap right radical hemicolectomy. She 
chose for a rap, right? Radical, we went ahead with that. This was a T3 N2, four nodes positive, no PNI, no LVI, with free margins. Now, since we have already discussed about the MSI, I'll just put it up right away. This was the IHC. MSI high, loss of MLH, PMS2 protein expression. What are the next things that you would, what will be your clinical diagnosis? Why are, and what are the criteria that you would uh, put the patient in? Dr. Charan first and then Dr. Rajendra. Sir, uh, it will be come under the link syndrome, sir, with the mutation in MLH1 and PMS2 with the MSI high. So it will be stage three. This is with the link syndrome, sir. What are the criteria you are basing this patient on? You want to see the history again? This is the history. The patient has a like. A this three, is the diet. Three, three generation are involved, and one is primary, like two successive generation, including the first degree relatives. With the what, are, what is that criteria? Amsterdam two set or Amsterdam one. And when MSI is high, sir, then it will like confirmation of the diagnosis of the link syndrome is there. Anything, uh, Mr. Kaur? Uh, exclusion of, exclusion of PAP, uh, we have not done, sir. Uh, we have to, APC mutation, uh, the, like genetic mutation is there, there or not. We have to rule out that also. You have ruled out FAP clinically. Clinically. So, okay, see, so you, you do not have, you do not have polyposis on the colonoscopy. So yeah. then, see, now if you sir. have uttered the word FAP in this patient, you are now getting again into a, a minefield. Sir, here uh, patient uh, found to have a stage 3 disease and patient will be required the adjuvant chemotherapy one setup that is. But here the surgery is done uh, right radical hemicolectomy where the patient has the Lynch syndrome. Now the question again same uh, came whether the total pro, uh, colectomy versus right uh, radical hemicolectomy. So if this surgery is done furtherly, like I would like to keep the patient in follow-up with a one-year uh, colonoscopy. So along with that, the patient will be sent for the adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Would you, with this, with this report, would you like to think about any adjuvant treatment or no? Yes, sir. So patient is required adjuvant chemotherapy, sir. Any uh, T3 and 2 uh, stage 3 disease? Anything, Dr. Batra, you would like to uh, ask? So, uh, so. No doubt, uh, going by the staging of the patient, this patient will be a candidate for actual chemotherapy. Let's focus again ourselves to Lynch. Now, we have the IHC findings of MSI high and loss of MLH1 and PMS2 with a positive family history conforming to Amsterdam criteria. So, my question to Dr. Chan and Dr. Ajinder is, will you do any further testing to confirm the Lynch or you will take these findings at face value to say this patient is suffering from a Lynch syndrome? In other words, what is the testing required for the confirmation of Lynch syndrome? Sir, when loss of ML, uh, MLH1 is there, so further uh, testing is required for um, beer of mutation, sir. So, mm -hmm. because where the methylation of L MLH1 uh, will lead to the sporadic, uh, uh, sporadic malignancies also. But here it is associated with the PMS2, so mostly it is suggesting of Lynch only. But I would so, like to do the uh, this one, uh, KRAS mutation, not required of KRAS, this one, uh, methylation of MLH1 and BRAF mutation, 600 VE, I would like to do. Once that is done, have you established that this is Lynch? And will exactly. you now? That's the question I was trying to ask. So it's one word he's saying that is, so if we, if we try to understand what what the MMR, what deficient MMR is, these are protein expressions on IHC. And the nucleotide repeats are checked whether the patient is MSI high or not. But these are not germ line mutation testings. You cannot call a proband that you are Lynch 
and then initiate a process of colonoscopic surveillance in all the relatives and on the basis of this msi am i correct very right dr kohl so please understand ihc is only the expression of the proteins yeah. which could be because of genetic germline mutation versus somatic mutation so the ihc expression doesn't depend upon whether it is a germline or somatic mutation so so you have to go for the genetic testing to find out whether these genes are mutated or not only then you can label them as lynch the amsterdam criteria was basically a device to find out what are your probabilities of having a lynch syndrome they never confirmed a patient to have lynch syndrome unless until you went for a genetic testing so ihc has given you an indicator along with the the family history along with the personal profile of the patient that probably patient is a lynch syndrome patient but before embarking upon whether to offer any uh, colonoscopy is opoplectic surgeries or uh, surveillance for the endometrial cancer you have to first establish your diagnosis based on the genetic testing of this patient and that's what something we were trying to ask from both of you so when you open this pandora's box of calling this patient to lynch on the basis of these two tests what happens is that the examiner goes back to understanding whether you have understood bethesda and amsterdam and you will be questioned that what percentage of lynch is amsterdam positive and what percentage isn't so that will be the next question so to we frame that what is the sensitivity and specificity sensitivity of amsterdam and, uh, specificity. only 50% of amsterdam to as so why did you why did you not flip a coin to call a patient lynch so next 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 colonic patient we can flip a coin and call it lynch then right like say if the history is so so we need to be so in fact if you go on to study uh, the amsterdam criteria you will realize the work from lindor that it is now actually being used for the sporadic familial colorectal cancer type x syndromes because germline mutation has to be done for lynch otherwise this is not lynch please proceed very pertinent point made by dr batra so my now when you do uh, um a testing whether we do it as a, would you do a multi gene testing or would you just do a test for an mmr now you have got these companies pushing for multiple uh, gene testing you know 50 genes 70 genes what would you do 70 genes if, dr dr rajendra yes sir uh, so if any known variant in the family is uh, we know it so we can send for the uh, uh, that gene specific uh, panel so if we don't know that like we can send for the multi panel multi gene panel would you defer dr charan uh, what are the pros and cons of multi gene testing sir multi gene testing will also identify the gene which are not uh, included in the lynch criteria and uh, their significance is not uh, validated sir so going back to what dr harur said previously the ethical issues with doing uh, gene panel testing you have to have a pre genetic counseling explain to the patient that i i am going to test you and i may find non actionable non actionable germline yes. mutations yes i may have actionable and non actionable and i may just tell you that it seems you have a genetic mutation but i cannot help you i don't know to how to risk stratify you which is worse okay and that will have a domino effect on the whole pedigree do you understand dr haru please so what so if you do a multi gene testing what what do you mean by a vus and what are the chances of you finding a vus and if you find a vus what will you do sir that is a variance of unknown significance so so if there are no known mutations like uh, which is uh, for the syndromes so these are uh, that that all will be considered as a variants of unknown significance and uh, so we could not tell like how much uh, like the significance in that like uh, how much it runs in the family 
and uh, what are the like extra colonic uh, manifestations of that uh, vus so so that unnecessarily gives anxiety apprehension to the patient so without uh, knowing relevant information to us anything you want to ask dr batra suppose uh, uh, dr ander and dr charan you have done genetic testing and uh, it has come as a vus so obviously uncertain significance would you keep this patient in follow up or would you keep track of this vus what is happening to this vus whether it is labeled in future as a pathogenic or a non pathogenic mutation yes sir uh, it open uh, the uh, significance of the other genes and uh, how they are behaving in their penetrance and uh, no 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 the vus that you have found the other things are normal you have found a vus as the yes. name says it is its variant of unknown significance yes. will it remain unknown forever or you uh, think that this needs to be followed to be clarified whether it is really pathogenic or non pathogenic do you have a moral responsibility to follow this vus yes sir why the relation of the gene with the patient or recurrence of the tumor or progression of the disease like it might have helpful in the future uh, investigation and uh, trial sir no so since you had ordered the test you had done the family counseling vus has come on a test that was advised by you it becomes imperative on your part try to keep touch with the touch base with the with the lab that has done it to further classify over next 1 2 3 4 years because vus will not remain vus forever so vus will be correlated with the development of the disease or known development of the disease so vus may in future become non pathogenic or pathogenic suppose it becomes pathogenic it is your moral duty to get in touch with the patient again or tell right from the start that since it is vus you cannot go as part to you have to be in follow up to find out whether it is going to be turning into a pathogenic in future or not so that's vus simply just don't disregard a vus as it is nothing it can prove something at which may be important for the patient i think in the interest of time we we should proceed with the further treatment and management of this patient read uh, so she underwent uh, adjuvant chemo and uh, then later on she also underwent a risk reducing uh, laparoscopic hysterectomy with salping oophorectomy surgery and then put on screening so what is the screening that you would suggest dr charan for this patient sir we can keep the patient on the uh, colonoscopy and endoscopy sir upper gi endoscopy esophageal gastroendoscopy so this uh, uh, along with the cytology and uh, urine analysis and uh, thyroid or uh, breast examination annually sir so the hysterectomy and salping oophorectomy was done was it done right or was was it necessary or was it uh, not required how would you counsel the patient dr rajendra uh yes sir uh, so in uh, in those uh, two uh, two mutations so there is a risk of um, carcinoma endo uh, carcinoma endometrium especially in pms2 so more chance of uh, carcinoma uh, endometrium is there so but there is no proven uh, there is no uh, trials proven that reduced mortality because of uh, risk reducing surgery hysterectomy and salping oophorectomy but it may reduce uh, this one uh, Malig uh, number of malignancies, inc incidence of malignancy in the future. Is there a reason there is no overall benefit? There is no OS benefit. So you're basically saying that endometrial cancer will not happen, right? Primarily, sir. And is there a benefit? And if there is not a benefit, why is there no, why is there not a benefit of doing this? you just said there is os there is no benefit, benefit is not there is why because uh, the other other malignancies which are uh, more aggressive and less survival comparing to the uh, uterine malignancy so in lynch endometrial cancer 88% will present as stage 1 so that is why there is no an os benefit but it has been done why and that's the right thing to do might be if uh, if the patient if surgery is not done 
so every uh, two to three years endometrial biopsy is required for the surveillance so that can be avoided uh, by doing the surgery we'll talk about it later but at 30 you start surveillance at 40 you can the benefit of continuing surveillance versus surgery which is done is uh, financial benefit is best so doing this is not bad as far as oophorectomy is concerned that is a borderline issue that we can talk about it can be done can cause chemical menopause yes but there is a there is an incidence of cancer there as well but it's much lower right so dr harur is asking you basically lifetime risk is there what is the lifetime risk? That is why it was done. And it was done at this time because childbearing was complete. Complete. Family was. What are the risks of other malignancies? If you could enumerate, what are the other malignancies that happen in Lynch, Dr. Charan? And like, sir, the uh, patient having a, can have a history of like a retinal adenoma or periapoly carcinoma. Or a patient can have gastric polyp or gastric uh, uh, adenomatous polyps also in uh, Lynch syndrome. And there can be pancreatic carcinoma or uh, ureter cancer or uh, renal pelvis carcinoma or carcinoma of gallbladder along with the history of endometrial and uh, ovarian cancer. History of prostate, uh, risk of prostate cancer is almost two times. And, uh, breast cancer is uh, debatable that uh, risk may be increased or uh, association is uh, seen there. Breast cancer? Breast cancer association is seen, sir, but uh, it is not... Uh, uh, well proven that how much risk is there. So the commonest cancer is endometrium it is almost uh, 60% yes, uh, and uh, almost nearly 20 times that of the normal population. Ovary is almost 12%. So that is what I think Mr. Paul was uh, referring to when he said that there is a increased risk but not as much as the endometrium. So now how would you screen these patients? Uh, what, what are the, the things that you would like to screen in this patient? The screening of these patients along with the colonoscopy will go with the upper GI endoscopy and uh, pelvic examination with the urine analysis or frequency. Frequency also. Uh, upper GI endoscopy, if there is no polyp, on, we can do two to three yearly. If the polyp is there, then we will uh, work according to the polyps and if you are able to do endoscopic management or uh, depend on the uh, that's it. And uh, urine analysis like uh, or uh, cytology, uh, we can do annually. Sir. And if the hysterectomy was not done? Then uh, we'll do uh, yearly pelvic examination and uh, pap smear examination, sir. We'll start at the age of 25 to 30 years. and uh, then Yearly pelvic do. examination only and pap smear, endometrial yeah. cancer. And uh, like uh, INC, we can also be able huh? to do, sir. Sorry? I and C, sir. Curetas, uh, so the endometrium curetas and biopsy. Yes, DNC. Uh, any, DNC, okay. DNC. Uh, Dr. Rajendra, anything you would like to add? Endometrial uh -huh. screening, you would straight away do a biopsy, you would do uh, any, any other uh, non invasive investigation? Uh, no, sir. Uh, pelvic, uh, pelvic examination, sir. Uh, one uh, this one and uh, otherwise endometrial biopsy two to three years uh, every two to three years. Not ultrasound. Ultrasonography can be done, but it's Transvaginal. not. Transvaginal. So okay, but what uh, are you looking for? What are you looking for essentially? Any uh, increased endometrial thickness. How will you find that? Okay, but there are a, two, two imagings you can do. Sir, MRI is or ultrasound. MRI. You can choose how to do it transabdominal or per, transvaginal. Transvaginal is obviously better. And an MRI, you will not subject this patient to an MRI for endometrial thickness only, right? So, transvaginal ultrasound is what I would do. Um, and then sir. you can do um, biopsies if you want to. And, uh, I sir. quite don't agree with the OGD bit. Um, I wouldn't do that outside a clinical trial. Uh, for Lynch. Uh, I'm not sure what guidance is. That's not my practice. Maybe Dr. Batra, Dr. Haru's practice. Um, can you please comment on that? No, I don't think OGD is required. In Lynch. In Lynch. And a dermatological examination annually is required, sir, in Lynch. 
Looking Anything good. else, uh, Dr. Batra, would you like to ask? Yeah, so uh, I'm not able to control my medical oncology. So Dr. Charan, Dr. Ajender, this <laughs> was a MSI high tumor. Sir. You have done the surgery, you have given six months of post-operative for pucks. But you <laughs> already know the data that for the MSI high tumors. Yeah, so I was waiting for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have already seen that in the metastatic setting with the MSI high tumors, immunotherapy does much better work than the classical chemotherapy. And you've already seen that in the neoadjuvant setting also. You must have come across the uh, splashing of the media by the 12 patients of Dostarlimab who went into a, um, a sort of a cure with the short-term treatment, long-term uh, data yeah. is written. Now this patient, if it says that if I am MSI high, I have done my surgery, am I a candidate for adjuvant immunotherapy? Yes, sir. Dr. Chanu, you said yes. So first yes, question, whether this patient's chemotherapy can be substituted with immunotherapy? If yes, why? If no, why? So, as an adjuvant uh, therapy, uh, uh, immunotherapy doesn't have a much role, sir. There is no uh, much benefit in uh, stage 3 specifically. So, Dr. Rajender, that's a very a drastic statement. So, the adjuvant treatment trials are still started. Okay, saying that it is not much role is not, uh, I would say, right thing, right sentence. So, typically, a uh, drug starts from the metastatic to neoadjuvant to the adjuvant setting. So, we have already seen the role both in the metastatic and neoadjuvant setting. Adjuvant setting, definitely the trials are owned, phase two trials are owned, based on the success of that these three trials will be coming. So based on the evidence that we have today, in a resected stage 3 colorectal cancer patient, there is no data which suggests there is a benefit of using adjuvant immunotherapy and you have to give a post-operative or perioperative chemotherapy itself. But in future, the way immunotherapy is coming big in most of the tumors, including the adjuvant setting, you may see immunotherapy coming as a better option than chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. So please, uh, uh, whenever you are Speaking something, measure your words. Don't say there is no evidence. Evidence is still accumulating. It's being generating. And maybe two years down the line, the same class, we will all talk about giving adjuvant immunotherapy to such patients. So if this patient was node negative, would you give chemotherapy, Dr. Charan? No, sir. We can avoid chemotherapy, sir, in the stage 2 disease. Dr. Charan, please don't point us like we can avoid. There are definite guidelines what to do, when to do. So Dr. Yes, Anil asked, it's a PT3, PN0 tumor. So we MSI can avoid, I... matlab, we can also give. We are not giving, sir, in the stage 2, sir. All patients across the board? No, with the risk feature, we'll conclude, sir. So in, with the... in this particular patient who is PT3, N0 with the MSII status, MSI do not advise adjuvant chemotherapy. No. MSI has a role uh, in deciding the chemotherapy, adjuvant, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy in stage 2 specifically. When MSI high is there in stage 2 without any high risk features such as uh, LVI, uh, poorly differentiated malignancy and if uh, uh, dissected uh, like, uh, greater than 12 lymph nodes, then there is no role. So that, that will come and low risk feature. What so, about PT4, PN0, MSI high? Uh, PT4, uh, sir, um, uh, even, even though MSI high, there is uh, in stage 2, there is no role, sir. Okay. So yeah. uh, that means across the board, PT3, PT4, or PN0? PN0 in stage 2. Okay. So what are, uh, just what are a basic question you're looking for? Sorry. I think we've got a. I think we've got a notification that we have 15 minutes for a case discussion. We have another case to go to, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's just let's progress. Otherwise, okay, there was okay, fine, fine. I think we'll just move on. Please read on tumor budding here, okay? Yes. Sir. And uh, you have to know what is microsatellite instability properly. Yeah, we have not asked you that question, but anyways. So the second case, I think we'll go through this quickly. This is a 38-year-old female. The recurrent episodes of bleeding per rectum for the past two years and associated abdominal pain. She had dizziness, palpitations, fatigue, significant loss of weight. Uh, abdominal examination unremarkable. However, PR examination shows a mass at the anal verge. 
I will straight away go to the colonoscopy. Colonoscopy showed a mass at the anal verge and mass in the transverse colon and numerous polyps, which were of varying size throughout the rectum sigmoid colon from which biopsies were taken. The biopsy showed moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma in the rectum and similar biopsy in the colon as well. CA was 12.4. That's the MRI. It is a it is a T4 a T3 T4 tumor which is infiltrating the muscle, and that is the colonoscopy picture. Spot diagnosis, Doctor Rajendra, with that kind of colonoscopy picture. First thing that comes to your mind. So oh. this is uh, FAP, sir. Family adipose. Family adipose. Hmm. Absolutely. What? Anything else you want to know? I've family history. The family history. The family history showed uh, her uh, all her siblings had uh, had polyps. Yet I don't know why she chose to ignore the, these uh, these findings. Uh, her uh, mother had uh, surprisingly FAP. Uh, her mother had FAP. Uh, beyond that, she could not give any further history. So that was the the any the this thing. Anything? Any other preoperative workup would you like? Um, the biopsy and mutation, sir. Gen genetic mutation for the APC gene will also like to do the confirmation of the uh, FAP syndrome. So, so On this it... biopsy, would it change your surgical management, or would you like to do it on the specimen? The same question that was asked. Yeah, in this case, sir, we already already that uh, multiple polyposis syndrome is there with the. Uh, Dual malignancy. We have to go with the uh, like a likely APR, sir. So with the total proctocolectomy and uh, and ileostomy. Be be very specific. Don't say APR with total proctocolectomy. What is the what is your surgical plan? We'll take this as a short case because I think we are running short of time. We'll uh, we'll do total proctocolectomy with uh, and ileostomy, sir. Just that this is a muscle infiltrative tumor. Straight away surgery. Sir, here to see the metastasis uh, first, uh, I would like to do uh, the CCT. Metastatic workup is normal. Metastatic workup is normal. Okay, sir. Locally, she is uh, locally at the anal verge, or mus it is muscle infiltrated. Sphincter. Sir, if, if there so was no he, colonic cancer, what would you have done? If there was no colonic cancer, what would you have done? So here, uh, sphincter is involved. Elap has to be done. Extra levator, uh, abdominal perineal re resection. Straight away, you would go ahead with surgery. New adjuvant treatment. treatment. Here, sorry, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, uh, total new adjuvant therapy followed by reassessment. Total new adjuvant therapy. There is a mass in the colon which is also positive. This is not a case for TNT. This is not a case for TNT. What was the other treatment, which was standard treatment before TNT came into uh, vogue, and still is the standard treatment in many parts of Europe? Uh, short course uh, radiotherapy. Conventional long course. No, he, here since uh, uh, colony mass is there, the short course RT uh, followed by uh, will take up for the surgery, sir. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree with that. Short course uh, radiotherapy. Any any differences, Mr. Kong? No, I would uh, I would be happy with either. Um, if the patient is not obstructive, I, I don't have any bones about either. Uh, what would Dr. Batra think? Unless the patient becomes obstructive, then there's a problem. I think there is a point uh, in doing a short course followed by surgery. For the yeah. So yeah. this is exactly what was done. A preoperative short course RT followed by a total proctocolectomy with end ileostomy, a ILA. Now, just for discussion's sake, if there was no anal uh, verge tumor and it was a tumor which was... Uh, there were uh, the rectum was relatively free of polyps. Would you offer any other surgical option, Dr. Charan? Uh, yes, sir. We can uh, do the rectal sparing uh, uh, total colectomy. Sir. What are the pros and cons of that? And the, the chance of rectal carcinoma is uh, rectal polyp development is there sir, in the post op surgery. So we have to do close follow. So what would you advise the patient? Uh, if patient is ready for active surveillance and uh, 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 close follow up, we can uh, go with the. Uh, polypectomy of the would rectum. You, would you do a rectal sparing or would you do a, a IPA? A, a I, uh, ileal, uh, ileal pouch with anal anastomosis. Uh, if the number of polyp and uh, 
it is like um, the rectum is relatively spared there are there are not many polyps there so i counted the polyps there are 18 polyps in the rectum no, yes, sir. there is a chance, chances of the rectal carcinoma so we can do polypectomy and uh, if it is possible we can spare the rectum with the iliorectal anastomosis okay. and uh, Sorry, like if there were 35 polyps, if there were 35 polyps, all of them were below 5 millimeter, then what would you do? Sir, here two surgical options are there. Uh, total proctocolectomy with ileal pouch channel anastomosis. One more is total colectomy with iliorectal anastomosis. It depends on the rectal burden of polyps. So that is rule of church is there where less than 20 polyps, greater than 20 polyps in the rectum. So when that less than 18 polyps are there, so the polyps can be resected with a colonoscope, uh, followed by uh, iliorectal anastomosis and uh, frequent follow-up, frequent uh, proctoscopy guided uh, polypectomy. So when 38 polyps are there, the uh, where a total proctocolectomy with IPAA is a, a better treatment option for the patient. Absolutely, I think that is Dr. Charan. That is the I think what you should remember. And you should counsel the patient well. Also, a lot of our patients do not really follow up well. So that is another thing that we should keep in mind when we advise them these options. So this was the, the surgery done. Uh, this is the histopathological uh, histopathology report. Multifocal, moderately differentiated, infiltrating the muscle with uh, without nodal metastasis. Anything else? Any further tests you would like to do on this? Sir, please biopsy report one, sir. This is the biopsy. Any further tests? We'll do the APC gene mutation test, genetic testing. Uh, sorry? The APC gene, uh, genetic uh, mutation testing in the tumor will likely to do so. This the okay. blocks. And suppose APC, APC is, uh, suppose APC is negative, then? Then MUTYH. Then associated, uh, associated mutation uh, like uh, uh, P10 mutation or... Uh, uh, and what is... <laughs> So what that brings variants. me to the point, what are the various types of FAP? So the classical uh, uh, FAP, sir, with more than uh, like, uh, or attenuated FAP, or MUTYH, uh, uh, or L MAP. MAP. Anything, Dr. Batra, you want to ask? No, uh, not specifically to do any further testing, but Dr. Charan and Dr. Ajender, listen carefully. You okay. have two patients. Both have polyps. One is a FAP. One is a Lynch. Both refuse to undergo a prophylactic surgery for the colon. No. Which is the patient? Who is the patient? You will be more, uh, I would say, in discussion to go for a, a very strict surveillance. FAP patient or the Lynch patient? Obviously, both need surveillance because they are not undergoing prophylactic surgery. Out of the FAP and the Lynch, who is the patient who is more at risk of developing a colonic cancer? Lynch carcinoma. Why? Because Lynch have the short duration of the mutation is MSI, MSHI and the proliferation of the MMR gene is a very high rate. Sir. That mutation will aggregate in a short span of time. So, and right. that so, cancer right. development is so, will take only three to four years in the even, the... even less than that, even less than that. Two, two to three years, you develop a full-blown cancer with the, with the polyp in the lynch. In contrast, FAP takes more years. And the reason is because with the MSI status high, you have more mutations accumulating over time, leading to the more chances of developing cancer. That's good. That's good. Would you like to consider an OGD in your patient? Yes, sir. When would you have liked, when would you have wanted it? Uh, as soon as the polyps are developed in the, on the screening of the colon cancer, sir, and then we we'll start. Particular sir, patient, in this particular in patient, in this particular in patient, the, in we have done an OGD. We'll do, sir. So you because are, this is, chances yeah, of uh, polyp is very high in these cases. 
pre yeah so so pre pre surgery you could have asked uh, dr haru and he has done it he was waiting for you to ask him yes whether you are going to challenge him to say that no doctor i cannot take this patient for surgery i would like uh, an ogt so it's a very pertinent thing to do because not only will you decide what uh, is there going to be an additional surgery to be done okay uh, you will also uh, decide uh, post operative surveillance based on the speaking and classification so go on uh, Do- dr harul uh, we can carry on sir yeah so uh... so that that was what i was waiting for you have to do an ogd scopy in every patient before pre op another another thing that may affect your surgery which is common in fap a non malignant condition desmoid desmoid disease desmoid and fibromatosis so as as they may, uh, mr call had mentioned before so your renal function test you might have a dilated ureter that should alert you to a finding of fibromatosis in intraoperatively that is something that also happens in an fap so now let, let me come to the last uh, i think yeah, we are we have 5 minutes left 5 minutes so let let me come to the last how will you screen this patient the this particular patient who has been operated and then uh, the other, uh, then the family as well how will you counsel them what is your advice and wh- how will you screen the uh, dr rajender yes sir uh, here uh, patient has end ileostomy so yearly even uh, ileoscopy has to be done other than that uh, other screening uh, like uh, U- usg neck for the thyroid malignancy and upper ge endoscopy every 2 to 2 uh, to 4 years um, and uh, uh, so um, that survey uh, patient has to be kept on surveillance and uh, other side all the uh, patient uh, uh, family members has to be done not ogd scopy sir so, ogd scopy every 2 to 4 years sir uh, so you mean okay. i mentioned sir you you mentioned sorry 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 yes, yes sir and uh, all uh, family members has to go for the genetic counseling and uh, uh, specific mutation any, test any any other malignancy you are missing out you no. said neck anything about the neck so uh, here uh, no. but brain malignancy uh, which is but it's not more common in a females around uh, less than 20 years sir so but since he is 34 years uh, so i am not going to test for that okay and the family uh, when will the screening start when will you advise them to start screening uh, here uh, family means like if you are considering about the uh, hepatoblastoma so the patient has to be uh, screened uh, within the first 6 months of life so other than that even uh, up to Colonoscopy, 10 to 15, when will you start screening 10 to 10 to, 10 to 15 years sir so where normally adenoma starts ogd scopy sir ogd uh, ogd scopy uh, uh, 20 to 25 okay anything else uh, mr call dr batra before we close the only thing is uh, with the two different profile of genetic syndromes what are the common brain tumors Lynch versus the FAP. In, in brain tumor, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, He's sir. Basically, uh, asking you what is Turcotte type one type two. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, where in Lynch syndrome, uh, brain glioblastoma are more commonly seen, and in FAP, uh, medulloblastoma are more uh, mainly seen, sir. No glioblastoma, but gliomas in the Lynch and medulloblastoma is in the FAP. So there is a difference between glioma and glioblastoma. Your multiple grades. The grade four is glial blast. Yeah. And you're good. Good. Very good. So, so when it comes to the OGD in FAP that you were trying to do, you were uh, you started at twenty uh, or twenty five. You said what would you? What is the interval? Uh, two, uh, two, two to four. Two, two to four years, sir. How will you decide two or four? How will you decide? So, if the strong family history is suggesting of uh, uh, duodenal malignancy. or it depends on the spiegelman criteria actually if uh, duodenal adenomas so yes. uh, so in uh, four gradings are there so in first grade uh, we can do after two years so in grade 2 we can do within the one year and grade 3 within the six months and grade 4 within the three months okay thank you thank you so much uh, that was uh, really nice uh, i think uh, good discussion and uh, i think i would uh, 
any any closing comments on each of them any suggestions to the examinees uh, first from uh, mr paul and then dr batra dr batra first please dr batra dr batra so uh, they they did a very good job uh, the concepts are clear uh, not much discussion about the exact surgical part but i think it was a good discussion about the uh, genetic syndromes which is not very commonly discussed but with the medical legal things coming up in a big way i think this is something which needs to be looked into each, each and every patient and that's why all the guidelines now have changed that msi to be done on all endometrial cancer patients as well as the colorectal cancer patients exactly you cannot just get away without doing this test and without doing the genetic counseling of the family patient and doctor fantastic very good uh, so both charan and rajendra well done uh, please be more articulate please practice your answers uh, avoid common traps as dr batra dr harur pointed out uh, the examiners uh, are always ask open ended questions they sit back they allow you to chart your course and if you listen to your examiners within the first because the exam is 30 minutes if i remember correctly with a long case uh, unless it has recently changed um no. so if the exam is 30 minutes within the first 3 to 5 minutes you can actually tell your examiner that this is my level please challenge me at this level and beyond and you can chart out your uh, course there is not much um the examiners uh, do not intend to bring research questions into fap and lynch they are looking for you to be safe clinicians and practice what standard medical care is which is amply mentioned in the book and is available to uh, both of you to read so well done both of both of you and uh, dr harur thanks for um, uh, thanks for such a wonderful case Dr. Batra, it's always a pleasure to uh, see you. I've seen you after a long time. You've been my senior, and you immensely supported me when I when I started off. I'm delighted to be, uh, you know, on the same panel as you. I have great regards for uh, Dr. Batra and Dr. Rao. Thank you. Uh, I will will have a small uh, talk. I will try to mention the pertinent points that I think that uh, in hereditary colorectal cancer there should be things that we should commit to our memory. Obviously, there is so much to uh, remember. it becomes slightly challenging i'll do that whenever i get uh, the go ahead from shrijan so thank you thank you uh, both my examiners you are great and uh, very very pertinent questions asked uh, both the examinees i think you've done well uh, rajender and charan good uh, i think i would i would agree with the uh, uh, call that you have to be more articulate uh, frame your answers well think of what what exactly the discussion that you are leading Uh, do not forget the basic things i don't think that the management per se will change remember to mention that management at least uh, you know put it as one of those points don't men- don't forget that just because your the examiner is focusing on a particular syndrome or a particular uh, case scenario otherwise uh, i think uh, excellently done uh, thank you for that uh, for these responses and thank you uh, shrijan and uh, rao sir Uh, it's always a pleasure to be a part of the ISO movement. So thank you, Dr. Chandra Mohan and ISO. Uh, thank you, Sridhar. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hiru, examiners and examinees. Uh, we now progress to our uh, second part of this webinar, which would be the expert talk uh, by Dr. Sandeep Kaul. Uh, while he loads up his screen, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Anil Hiru and Dr. Sandeep Patra to kindly stay. uh till the end because we'll have a short Q&A session with all the three examiners uh, before we wind up uh over to you dr paul uh good afternoon everyone um can you see my slides not yet okay so i thought i shared my screen let me go back to zoom no i hadn't sorry my fault um so um good afternoon everyone or good evening um um i am uh, my name is sandeep um i am uh, somebody who's who belongs to india uh, has um, lived his whole life there i've done my ms and my dnd surgical oncology uh, did my ms from jammu and my dnd from in uh, from delhi subsequently i had the opportunity to work in uh, my hometown as a surgical oncologist where um at that time i have received the immense support um from dr batra and the young oncology groups of india that we had started subsequently i've done a a lab colorectal fellowship uh, here uh, uh, and my current interests are uh, minimal maximal invasive colorectal cancer abdominal wall recon 
and uh, site reduction in high tech. Srijan uh, gave me uh, this brief that the contemporary management and controversies in hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes is my topic. Uh, and I was also told that this is a 25 minute talk, which was a slight <laughs> a bit of a challenge because I do, I do understand that there are conferences that happen on this topic, which go on for three days. Um, so what I've tried to do is that I have, um, uh, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritties of discussing what Lynch and what uh, FAP and how it happens and what PJS is, because um, we all understand uh, that bit. Uh, the contents of my talk today are a, a brief introduction. Um, the hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes and the approach to proband, which I think is the most pertinent bit to any um, hereditary uh, disease entity, whether it is cancer or non-cancer. Uh, I would want to uh, mention pertinent points in Lynch syndrome management, uh, which I would want to commit to my memory and obviously uh, the, the memory of uh, co um, colleagues and people listening in today. And uh, FAP and its modifications, which are AFAP and MAP. There are some other polyposis syndromes. Uh, I haven't been able to go into all of them within the limitation that I have. And I do want to discuss the future. Uh, and, and the prime reason why I want to discuss the future is that there are a lot of junior colleagues who are actually listening in today. And I personally feel uh, the future in uh, hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes um, will be decided uh, by volumes and volumes will come from countries like India. So uh, a brief introduction, 35% of all colorectal cancers in, has some hereditable factor of some domination that we do not understand yet. 29% of the UK population has a family history of uh, a first degree or a second degree relative with colorectal cancer. Just to understand some population statistics, the UK has about a 66 million population with about 40,000 new cancers every year. Um, obviously, thankfully, this is not the case in India because that would have meant something with the Indian population would have meant something like uh, eight and a half lakh colorectal cancer cases uh, in a year. Um, I had a discussion with Dr. Haru previously that yes, we are catching up because there is obesity, there is processed meat that is coming in, other risk factors, which are environmental factors and westernization is happening. So all the ills are traveling. Uh, and thus, we need to establish early on when we um, deal with the colorectal cancer that am I dealing with a familial herd? Uh, a, fam a familial cancer or am I, am I dealing with a family history colorectal cancer or am I dealing with a hereditary colorectal cancer? And by definition, a hereditary colorectal cancer is a phenotypically diverse group of disorders that will exhibit a distinct pattern of inheritance and progeny. And that happens in about 5 to 10% of all colorectal cancer diagnoses. Uh, depending upon what kind of data you're ready to listen to, most would want to uh, tend on uh, tend to verge on the five to six percent barriers, where there are others who think that ten percent is what we're actually dealing with. Now, the importance of hereditary colorectal cancer is there is increased clinical and research significance. The advances in genetic diagnosis uh, that are happening need to be implemented on these patients. There are in, uh, improvements in endoscopic uh, and surgical control. Um, endoscopically, um, a lot of um, polyposis patients are being managed uh, very successfully for as long as possible. Uh, medical and lifestyle interventions, can they actually change outcomes in these cancer syndromes and how effective are they? And prevention and the effective treatment in susceptible individuals is also something that we will have to understand in our clinical lifetimes. Um, and these, these guidance will change as well. So the most important part of the talk is the approach to ProBand. ProBand is the person who has actually initiated the investigation of a syndrome. So the patient who was diagnosed with cancer, or if there was a patient's relative who has had a cancer and he allows his tumor tissue to be tested, then that person becomes the ProBand. Now, how can a proband be established? The common methods in which a proband will be established is colonoscopy, 
if there is a personal cancer diagnosis and testing on the tumor if there is direct germline testing that this is direct germline testing means uh, direct to the customer germline testing which has ethical issues which are eluded as in the fact that there is there has to be pre and post genetic counseling the if there is um, uh, non clinician initiated uh, germline testing uh, and a vus is noted uh, responsibilities need to be decided and obviously a proband can be established by risk prediction modeling and if there are there are some methods of risk prediction and if there is uh, those predict those predictive models uh, throw up a value which is more than 5% then uh, we find a method to establish proband now the american college of gastroenterologists has guidelines about family history and expanded pedigree when you're dealing with hereditary colorectal cancer the history has to be comprehensive there has to be a three generation pedigree it has to be accurate it has been noted that the accuracy of first degree history is more than 75% however the second degree relative history can vary from 50 to 80% this doesn't bode well for creating a good pedigree chart then there is a minimal data set that has been alluded into at the nccn guidelines the um, acg guidelines and the bsc guidelines where the current age the age of diagnosis the age and cause of death consanguinity the type of cancer uh, ethnicity national uh, the country of origin and inherited conditions and birth defects need to be eluded this obviously will lead to the discovery of more syndromes this obviously will also lead to the discovery of more actionable uh, germline mutations so you risk stratify these patients when you have a family history of colorectal cancer you risk stratify them to what you consider as average risk which is less than two fold the general population then moderate risk where there are criteria as per the british society of guidelines which they consider between 2 to 6% uh 2 to 6 fold uh, risk and then there is the high risk which is more than 6 fold risk of the general population now when you see a patient and you have a history that makes you think this is family history then you can go down the family history of colorectal cancer and not think that this is a hereditary cancer but if you see more than 10 endometrous polyps you see more than two hematomas polyps or you see five serrated polyps proximal to the proximal to the sigmoid colon we must uh investigate this patient as a possible proband who is having hereditary colorectal cancer when family history is noted initially lynch and polyposis need to be clinically ruled in or ruled out if you rule them out then you are looking at family history within family history you must understand that this flow chart is from the british society uh, of um, gastroenterology so if i show you the average risk there is already a national screening program that is dealing with this average risk which starts with a quantitative fit test which uh leads to a trigger for investigation at 6 nanograms uh and per dl and then will lead to a colonoscopy so that's that's what will eventually happen to an average risk patient to a moderate risk patient the q fit is taken away from the picture so the patient gets a colonoscopy at 5 at 55 years and then subsequently for both these two patients what happens is that post colonoscopy surveillance and even if there were polyps post polypectomy guidelines if there is not an advanced adenoma which is more than 10 mm if there is not a adenoma which has more than 25% of villus architecture if there is not a complex polyp if there is not a large non pedunculated complex polyp then surveillance will be at 3 years otherwise the patient will go into national screening again for high degree high risk patients you will do a colonoscopy 5 year early till the starting from the age of 40 and obviously if you do discover syndrome you go to the syndromic guidelines which i will allude to later so mentioning lynch briefly uh 
most common inherited colorectal has an autosomal dominant condition it's defined by the dna mismatch repair genes or the epcam gene that is the fifth one that can cause it there are right sided tumors and there is an accelerated adenoma carcinoma sequence as we discussed earlier with within 35 months versus 10 years which will happen in a sporadic colorectal cancer now there are some statements that we do have in lynch syndrome and what is the evidence for it is how i'm going to structure the rest of my talk as far as testing is concerned all newly diagnosed have to be tested for mmr and that is accepted now and the reason is the general prevalence of msi can be 7 to 19% but all of them don't have to be lynch okay this generally should be done pre op the risk of metacrine the risk of metacrine cancer rates will have to be discussed with the patient if the patient is discovered to be lynch and we must understand that if there is a braf mutation then there literally no lynch syndrome patient has a braf mutation ihc testing is standard for those two, two proteins for those four proteins and if there is mlh1 then we go for a braf mutation and mlh1 hypermethylation to test what it is we offer testing for amsterdam 2 for bethesda positive and we also offer testing if there is a risk prediction model which shows that there is a possibility of lynch if more than 5% i will allude to those risk predictive models later they are available online the statements and evidence for surveillance and surgery the statements are that colonoscopy needs to be performed two yearly in a lynch syndrome these annual colonoscopy to be considered in confirmed mutational carriers who have a particular um, pathology which is more frequent we must understand that hnpcc is a misnomer hnpcc does not mean that there are no polyps it just mean there is no polyposis so there are polyps there are about 10 proximal polyps generally and the mean age of diagnosing colorectal cancers is between 44 to 61 compared to 69 in a, a sporadic colorectal cancer for msx mutations in women there is a lower risk for developing a lifetime risk for cancer which is about 30% versus 79 70 or 69% which is expected across the board now these polyps can be they are proximal they are flat rather than elevated and they demonstrate villus features high grade dysplasia and and what we call til or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes the lifetime risk for an mlh1 or an msh2 ranges from 22 to 74% and it's obviously lower for msh6 and pms2 and that's why there are guidelines which agree that uh, surveillance or, or screening in these patients can be delayed by a few years and does not need to be as intense coming to the surgical bit in lynch we can offer a total colectomy with an ileo rectal anastomosis but we must explain to the patient that the metacrinous rates can be as below at 30 years you can have as high as a 69% cancer in the remaining area so if you are doing a segmental resection it is it is um, it is allowed in lynch syndrome you can do a segmental resection for example in our patient we could have done a right hemicolectomy however we must ensure that this patient remains in a prolonged surveillance period and understands the risks involved obviously the other risks and benefits of uh, uh, preserving um, the bowel are there with regards to bowel motions the risk for colorectal cancer for a total colectomy with ipa if we end up doing that there are still up to 3.4% can have cancer and usually increases if there is a staple joint and this is the same for fab now the statements and evidence for extracolonic gynecology are that at 40 to 45 th bso after child bearing age endometrial cancer screening biopsy and tvs at 30 to 35 it is a second most common cancer lifetime risk is 15 to 71% there is no survival benefit and the reason that happens is that stage 1 presentation is in 88% of these patients the incidence of endometrial cancer is 33% and the ovarian cancer is about 5.5 to 12% depending upon which literature you read the sensible approach is surveillance at thir- starting at 30 and surgery at 40 egd 30 to 35 yes 
treat H. pylori if you want to. This is generally not in my practice. I, we do not do that in, in, um, as per NHS guidelines. Clustering should be registered. So there will be clusters which will have particular pathology, specific pathology, whether it's urinary, pancreas, prostate, breast. Though there is no indicated surveillance, uh, uh, no indicated screening for them, if there is clustering, then we must include that kind of screening. The risks for gastric cancer, small bowel cancer, urinary tract cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer are documented in this slide. Prevention. Diet. There cannot be any guidance, unlikely to be one. It will be difficult to do a randomized control trial. Smoking. The, ratio, the risk reduction, smoker, past smoker, and never smoker is 6.1 6 into with a ratio to three, with a ratio to one. For weight, the BMI more than 25 has an increased hazard ratio of 8.7. And the CAP2 trial has studied resistant starch and aspirin for chemo prevention and did not uh, find significance. However, 600 milligrams of aspirin did show a reduced uh, cancer. However, this was possibly because of De, uh, more frequent luminal investigations because if you give a patient 600 milligrams of aspirin, the patient is likely to have more uh, bleeding episodes, which will automatically uh, lead to um, uh, luminal investigation. CAP3, the results are awaited, and it's basically studying the optimal dose of aspirin to guide us further. Predictive models are illuminated here. They are enumerated here. They are available online. And they basically guide you to whether germline mutation testing should be done in a patient who you have recently operated. There are ethical issues. There has to be genetic counseling, the direct to customer uh, testing. There are um, concerns regarding that. And as I said before in the talk as well, and was discussed with our exam, 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 examinees, that there will be non-actionable mutations and patient needs to understand that has limited clinical utility in determining which patients should undergo genetic testing for Lynch. So uh, if I was having an MSI uh, and MMR guidance, uh, deficient MMR guidance for it, I would possibly not use these predictive models. I would go for the, 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 the testing anyway. As far as surveillance is concerned, these are the BSG guidelines. Colonoscopy starting at 25, two year little 75. If it is MSH6 and PMS2, because there is a reduction, there is a reduced penetration of cancer in those patients, the, the start is at 35 rather than 25. Lynch-like syndromes, uh, we still treat them like Lynch. Now coming to the adenomatous polyposis syndrome. So adenomatous polyposis syndrome, the phenotypes are FAP, AFAP, and MAP. They all invite germline testing. They constitute one to 2% of colorectal cancers and more than 10 cumulative colorectal adenomas with a family history with FAP type extracolonic manifestations basically points to their direction. In FAP, there are more than 100 adenomas at least. It is autosomal dominant. It does not have a male, uh, it does not have a sex distribution and about 2.3 cases in every 100,000, which in India would expectedly mean something like 32,000 patients across the country, which is significant. AFAP, will be 10 to 99 adenomas, autosomal dominant with average 25 polyps. Now, MAP is an attenuated polyposis syndrome. It is autosomal recessive. There are 20 to 99 adenomas. But one of the beauty thing, beautiful things about MAP is that MAP has 29% of patients which are below 100 adenomas and 29% which are above. So it could have a more varied presentation and prevalence also. Now, coming to the genotypes, FAP has the APC mutation, which is common in all of them. It is 100% penetrant. One third are de novo mutations. That means they do not have a family history. And the APC is a tumor suppressor gene. And it does follow the nuts and double hit hypothesis because one allele is mutated in FAP and the second is damaged by a somatic event. The same genotype has different phenotypes. So it could be AFAP. The mutation is at different locations along the uh, chromosome five. And if there is, and then there is MAP, which monoallelic is about one to 2% of the population. 
but it is the biallelic ones which cause a syndrome and there is some clinical significance and they have nearly a two-fold elevated risk of cancer compared to the uh, general population. Pap screening, the colonoscopy needs to start at the age of 12 or 10 years below the last, below the youngest uh, pro, uh, proband relative. Gastroscopy and dinoscopy start, needs to start at the age of 25. And the, uh, in, the intensity of the gastroscopy and dinoscopy needs to be according to the Spiegelman criteria, which I will allude to in a bit. It is considered acceptable to start surveillance in FAP with a sigmoidoscopy because if they are left-sided uh, polyps will be visible and until polyps are noted a colonoscopy may not be required. Uh, obviously with MAP the surveillance is less intense and starts much later at the age of 18 and gastroscopy and duodenoscopy start at 35 but they occur according to the same speaking classification. The screening the difference between FAP and Lynch is there is no accelerated adenoma carcinoma sequence. The mean age is 35 years as per the St. Mark's registry. The mean age of polyp occurrence is 15.9 years. The mean age of de novo FAP, they present with 25% who present with their first diagnosis with cancer. And the mean age of FAP diagnosis with colorectal cancer is 39. So the difference between the first and the second is that you can see that uh, you have a four year lead time on average for FAP before cancer presents. So you will have a patient who presents with chronic diarrhea, um, abdominal pain, bleeding per rectum, a positive fit test, and you put in a scope and you find FAP. And you may find FAP with cancer, but there is a possibility that you will find FAP without cancer and that can allow you to make interventions in a timely manner. 41% are synchronous and 7% are metachronous cancers and 84% of them are distal to the splenic flexure. And that's why sigmoidoscopy plays a pertinent role in starting off the screening before we move on to colonoscopy. When we're screening the duodenum, there is a 100% lifetime risk of duodenal polyposis. This is one of the second most, the second most common reason why patients will die from cancer after colorectal cancer. 5% have duodenal cancer and the BSG guidelines do not commit to a three monthly uh, endoscopic examination for grade four. It's slightly more generous at six to 12 monthly. <clears throat> Coming to AFAP and MAP. In AFAP, the adenoma appearance starts at 10 to 20 years versus FAP, 10 to 20 years later compared to FAP. And the cumulative risk is 30% less uh, compared to FAP, which is nearly 100% cancer rate, there is cumulative risk is 69% in eight years with an average diagnosis age of 52. In MAP, 19% will have cancer by the age of 50. They will be predominantly right-sided. There will be synchronous cancers. The cumulative risk will be 63% at 60 years. It constitutes 29%. The phenotype you can appreciate, this phenotype, this the 100 to 1,000 adenomas 29% will be that. They will confuse the clinician that this is MAP or a FAP until the genetic mutations show up. And like Lynch, there is an accelerated adenoma carcinoma sequence. FAP and surgery, indications of early surgery. If you have polyps more than 10 millimeter, if you have high-grade dysplasia, if you have a marked increase in number between the two surveillance colonoscopies. What are our options? We can do a TC or total colectomy with an ileorectal anastomosis, please preserve the IMA here. This will only be offered to the patient if there is less than 20 rectal adenomas. There is less than 1,000 in some, some, some literature quotes, 500 colonic adenomas. And the advantages are obviously that there is a, a better sexual function. And in females particularly, there is better fecundity. The reason I'm asking you to preserve the IMA here is that this IMA will guide you to allow you to do a completion proctectomy when, uh, when the rectal uh, preservation can no long, longer be done. Now, the other option available is total proctocolectomy with IPAA. It's not required in AFAP and MAP, but yes, it is to be done in uh, FAP. Pouch cancer incidence is about 1% at 10 years and increases with a stapled anastomosis. 
Now, with an IPA, you must understand in an IPA cannot be done if there is concomitant Crohn's, if there is a poor uh, pelvic floor, there is a poor sphincter control. And one pertinent point that IPA cannot be done if there is concomitant desmoids, which will prevent um, your um, mesentery to reach the pelvic floor. There are some uh, mesenteric lengthening surgical procedures that surgical oncologists should be aware of, which include entering the retroperitoneal plane, uh, mesenteric slits, uh, ligation of the ileocolic artery, we, uh, which uh, are something that you should uh, acquaint yourself prior to attempting an ileal pouch uh, in anastomosis. FAP and desmoids, they happen in 15%. There is no dedicated pre-op evaluation unless it is kindred specific. If there is a kindred of FAP, where there is too much desmoid happening, then yes, desmoid surveillance can be done or screening can be done. Post-op, there is usually no dedicated imaging. However, MRI scans at three years can be done and they can be followed up later. However, currently not accepted by the uh, BSG guidelines. Chemo prevention has been attempted with sulindac and erlotinib to reduce the polyp rates. However, has not been used because of side effects. And once diagnosed, um, MRI solvents can be done. Um, estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen at very high doses, which have to be gradually upregulated from 30 milligrams a day to 120 milligrams a day, along with sulindinac of about 300 milligrams a day, as per the post protocol, is what is done to um, uh, rein them in. Surgery is not indicated for desmoid unless it is for palliative indication for a uh, desmoid which is compressing uh, or causing compressive features. LAP versus open. LAP definitely has been shown to have an advantage in a few trials. The LAP desmoid rate was 4% versus an open desmoid rate of 7%. It was considered to be significant. So sorry, there is a, mm, there is a, um, there is a spelling error here. It's a hematomous polyposis. Uh, in Pius Jagger syndrome, there are benign hematomatous polyps, there are hyperpigmented macules which do disappear in age. So, and so you should see these mucocutaneous uh, papu, uh, uh, hyperpigmentation in the young age. You will see them in the first and second decade, and then you will not see them. So, if you are seeing an adult, do not look for mucocutaneous uh, pigmentation, and because you will not find it. I've mentioned the prevalence. What is need, need, the, the increased risk of colorectal cancer has not been quantified, but it does exist. EGD, colonoscopy, and a video capsule endoscopy starting at the age of eight. So this is the uh, syndrome which has the youngest um, luminal investigation uh, age to start with, and the youngest uh, um, surveillance indication, which is for hepatoblastoma for FAP, is starting from six months of age. But for this, it starts at eight years. 50% the first episode is by 16 years, usually in interception. Chemo prevention has been attempted. Uh, it's all under study. <clears throat> so that mentions the surveillance uh, below. Uh, the juvenile polyposis syndrome, again, hematomous polyps, autosomal dominant, more than five juvenile polyps in the colonorectum. One should consider this patient uh, for a possible uh, syndromic um, disease. It is, there is a lifetime risk of colorectal cancer. It has not been quantified, but there is a 39 to 68%. And the resection to be done if the polyp cannot be managed endoscopically. And the genes which are associated with our, uh, the SMAD4 and the BMPRA1A and others. And according to which gene is, um, uh, which variant this is, the surveillance is uh, denoted accordingly. What is the future? Now, very recently, I was speaking to a very, um, very esteemed um, gynae oncologist who has uh, his background is from data science. The future is data science and syndromes. And as was noted in uh, by Dr. Batra when he mentioned um, unknown significance, it is unknown significance today. But if enough data can be generated, the every variation of unknown significance is actually a research opportunity. So given where the volumes are, which 
are in countries like India. Uh, that is where the future of syndromic disorders and the treatment of these syndromic disorders will be decided. And that is where data science and surgical oncology or oncology as in such is important. Improved genetic counseling needs to be done for partial penetrance. A chemo prevention, the jury is still out. CAP3 has to be reported. And maybe this is scientific fidelity or maybe this is the future, but eugenics. And will we be able to alter our FAP patients? Will we be able to uh, delete um, uh, virulent um, genetic mutations? Uh, is that around the corner? Um, is CRISPR going to do something for us? Um, I think the future will tell, but hopefully we will see something in our lifetime. I would like to thank uh, the Indian Association of Surgical Oncologists, um, Dr. Rao and um, uh, Srijan for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk to my colleagues. Um, it was a pleasure examining, uh, um, ex uh, examining trainees and uh, Dr. Batra and Dr. Anil, you are fantastic colleagues. I'd also like to thank the organizing uh, committee like Dr. Chandra Mohan, who uh, gave us uh, this opportunity to run such a beautiful program. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing, sir. I hope I did not... Uh, no, no, you didn't, Dr. Paul, yeah. So thank you, Dr. Paul, for that excellent uh, talk, thought-provoking uh, in the NMX uh, ad. Uh, this brings us to the last segment that we have Q&A for our experts today. Uh, so I request uh, Dr. Anil Hedur and Dr. Uh, Sandeep Patra to kindly unmute. Uh, what I've done is I have clubbed the questions into uh, four or five questions. Uh, some of these have already been covered by Dr. Call in his talk, but we would uh, uh, revisit them uh, to take uh, the opinion of others. Uh, so the first one is uh, I've... Uh, posted this to Dr. Anil Herur, and it is, uh, is there a role of PET-CT once we have a confirmed case, for us, case of a carcinoma associated with Lynch or FAP, for example, to rule out other cancers in the body? Is PET-CT uh, an investigation for it? So uh, I, I don't really think that PET-CT should be done in uh, each and every case. Targeted screening will be more than sufficient. Uh, in order to make out if there are any other cancers. So no particular need to do a PET CT. Um, I don't, uh, the, the guidelines do not make, really mention it. Yeah. Uh, any difference of opinion from Dr. Call and Dr. Batra? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing a PET CT to look for other cancers. What I would be actually doing, I'll just get the scans reported and I would like to give my radiologist the, the complete clinical history of this patient. So that you know, the oncologist, my radiologist, can guide me. I don't know if they, I don't know. Uh, maybe somebody else differs from me, but that would I, my opinion would concur with Dr. Haru. Great, uh, Dr. Batra. I would agree with what Dr. Cole and Dr. Haru have said. Perfect. So our sec second question is to Dr. Batra here, and that is why is uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy less effective in MSI high patients? So basically, uh, the MSI high status is doing the same job that we expect uh, the chemotherapy to do. Get entangled into the DNA, get into the machinery of replication, cause the DNA damage and leading to accumulation of errors, leading to a cell death. And an MSI high status is already doing what the chemotherapy is going to do for us. And that's why chemotherapy becomes less effective uh, in the MSI tumors. And five of you is the glaring example. Uh, patients given only five of you in the in the any sort of setting in the MSI tumors doesn't do better than only observation or immunotherapy in such patients. So the logic says that uh, if you are getting the same thing because of the cellular or genetic hierarchy or the structure, then why to add another toxicity to create the same effect which can be produced? Perfect, sir. Uh I go on to the third question, which is uh, directed this to Dr. Call, uh, but I think he has uh, uh, touched upon it in his talk, uh, which is, uh, can we offer genetic testing on a patient's request when there's no family history or even the patient does not have any cancer or any features of that syndrome? Uh, would you be comfortable uh, uh, complying to this request uh, from a patient's side? 
So uh, since I understand how healthcare is practiced in India, if there is a concern that the patient is highlighting, I will say that, okay, I can put you in a predictive model. And if I get a predictive model score of which implies that you should be tested, I will offer it to them. But that will not happen without pre-testing genetic counseling to understand what the outcomes of the test can be. However, if the predictive models though some of them are validated and some may not be validated as much, do not give me that breaching 5% figure. I would not because it opens up a Pandora box, uh, which, um, which I have no control over and neither does the patient. And for a patient you have cured of cancer to live in uncertainty, especially a young one uh, from the age of 34 to God knows when, uh, it is just criminal. Right. Uh, Dr. Herrera and Dr. Batra, uh, anything to add? So I think uh, most patients do not really understand what genetic testing implications are, especially in our society like ours, you know, when people come up with, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, with advice regarding marriage proposals with, uh, and genetics for cancer. I think there are a lot of implications that go just beyond that individual patient. A lot of counseling is required, I think, uh, before a testing is done. It cannot be pushed as uh, some kind of laboratory test. So, um, Too I many ethical say, issues. Yes. So, provided we have done the counseling, provided ethical issues are sorted, we can go ahead with the patient request without a family history of any cancer or feature syndrome because... This may be the first patient who has developed a germline mutation and would, would be capable of passing to the progeny. So I think uh, there's nothing wrong in uh, align, uh, uh, aligning with the patient request for getting a test done provided uh, thorough counseling and making the patient understand about all the issues, whether ethical or other things have been explained to the patient. Uh, we'll go ahead with the next question, the surgical one. Uh, that is in uh, posterior excentrations or when you are combining a, you know, a abdominal perineal uh, resection or excentration with a hysterectomy, uh, there is a dead space in the pelvis. So do we have to fill it? Are we supposed to just leave it? Do we have to reperitonize the uh, pelvis peritoneum? What is the approach of our surgeons here? Dr. Haru, you go first. Your name yeah. is uh, so uh, basically, I think uh, we are talking about two surgeries. One is the regular abdominal perineal resection and ELAP. As far as abdominal perineal resection is concerned, before the laparoscopic era, we used to actually religiously try and reperitonalize the entire thing. Nowadays, we most of our cases we do not do that, and uh, we have not faced any problems. Um, the other thing is regarding ELAP, you will definitely require some kind of uh, reconstruction as far as the space is concerned. Uh, it is usually a flap. That's what we prefer. We either take the rectus abdominis, the VRAM flap, or uh, the gracilis um, uh, as our, we involve the plastic surgeons for it, um, or a dermal matrix that, that can be put. So some kind of reconstruction definitely required as far as uh, ELAP is concerned. <laughs> So my, uh, my only uh, difference in practice is that um, I definitely I do not reperitonalize. I uh, not regularly try to fill the space. Uh, if there is an extended resection, a very big defect or an elate that has been done or a massive exam that has been done, I would use a, an acellular matrix uh, like permacol or I would prefer, I, I, we shy away from using uh, 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 VRAMs. Uh, unless unless our um, area is so radiated that we can't use um, eye gaps or S gap flaps or uh, uh, or a gra or a gracilis, we try to shy away from um, uh, from um, the abdominal uh, uh, donors. And the prime reason is that the patients here are um, more obese, and um, the the outcomes are slightly poorer than I have seen uh, back home in India. Uh, our last question, and I think we just uh, started discussing about this in the last slide of Dr. Call is how often are uh, these VUS redefined? And can a VUS defined today become a significant one next year? Uh, has that happened already? Or is it just a thing which is going to happen in the future? And 
if that has happened or is going to happen, should we be alerting our prior patients? Dr. Patra. So, uh, so Dr. Cole mentioned something called data science. So how do the BUS get defined into a pathogenic or benign is by following the patients who had BUS and then finding out whether they developed the disease or not, similar disease or another disease for the testing for which the testing was done. And that's what the data science does. So it's not done on an annual basis. Usually most of the big labs have interconnected data to which there is an access to the uh, uh, international organizations. And probably every five to 10 years, a redefinition, redefinition is done. The uh, best example is that for a BRCA1 and BRCA2, which has been done in the ovarian cancer for many years now. And uh, just to cite an example, testing about 865 BRCA1, BRCA2, there were 55 visuous mutations over a span of 10 years, of which 10% were found to be pathogenic in future, but that is over a span of 10 years. Now, that is something that when the, when the internet and other sciences or data science was not developed in 2010 to 15, nowadays, every two to three years, there is a VUS redefinition done to find out whether they are benign, they are still VUS or they are pathogenic. So I think uh, I've already conveyed that, that it takes about five years to define a VUS into a specific category, but still about 30-40% VUS may still remain VUS. As far as alerting to our prior patients, if you have counseled a patient you and you have got a VUS, it becomes imperative for us to keep in connect with the lab to find out from their database whether they are going to further uh, recategorize into a pathogenic or benign. If it turns benign, inform the patient. If it turns pathogenic, inform the patient. Right. I will, uh, I will just reiterate that every VUS is nearly a research question. Every VUS. There is a PhD that comes out of every VUS. If you go to a human genetics uh, lab anywhere in India, there will be people who find syndromes in families like um, I have been associated with a few where there, there was a family which could not, there was a village which could not, um, which everybody was born deaf. They just run a genomic panel on it and then they find the defect there, which is common there. So whether it is of significance or whether it can, if it is replicated elsewhere and will it cause the same problem, um, this time will tell. And uh, I think the VUSs should be taken seriously. Um, they cannot be wished away, if I can say that. Thank you, Dr. Bhattan. Uh, this concludes our uh, academic discussion for the webinar today. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the examinees, Dr. Charan Singh and Dr. Rajender Bhaisetti, uh, for agreeing to participate in this topic. It's not easy for residents to agree uh, to come on a national platform and face examiners, not just from one but two specialities and two countries and uh, face them uh, head on and answer their questions. So congratulations to both for agreeing to participate and doing it so wonderfully well. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Sandeep Batra, uh, whose uh, value addition to this uh, masterclass has been spectacular. Uh, we have made it a point to make these masterclasses multidisciplinary because uh, a well-rounded discussion only happens when we hear all the uh, opinions from all our colleagues across different uh, uh, specialties. Thank you, Dr. Batra, for making time for us, and we would love to have you again in the future. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anil Herur for uh, creating those amazing cases. Uh, it's not uh, easy to uh, be ready with these uh, materials. Uh, it's not like we can inform somebody and within two weeks you'll find a case of Lynch and Fap lying in your OPD. So, uh, uh, kudos to him to have that uh, ready at hand and create it uh, so wonderfully well uh, so that we had this wonderful discussion. Doctor, uh, Thank you, Dr. Anil Herur, uh, for that effort and uh, making the first part of this webinar such a great success. Uh, lastly, Dr. Sandeep Kaul, uh, we uh, thank you for uh, these amazing slides and uh, making uh, the expert talk a bit open-ended because... Uh, uh, it gives the stimulus to uh, all the participants here to go back, read up, uh, find what is relevant to our uh, scenario here. 
and uh, be ready for what comes up uh, in the OPD the next day. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandeep, call for that. It's uh, a pleasure. I would talk. love any feedback. I've left my email. I would love any feedback if you if you would provide any or my other ex my other moderators or examinees or other people who are listening. I would I would appreciate feedback. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity, Shrijan. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I would like to also thank uh, uh, Dr. Rajendra Rupani and Dr. Chandra Mohan for uh, continuously supporting uh, this uh, masterclass series. Uh, we would like to thank uh, the Academic Council, uh, which is uh, supporting us throughout, Dr. Uh, Harit Chaturvedi, Dr. Sanjay Kapoor, Dr. Sanjay Sarma, and Dr. Hemant Raj, for guiding us throughout this process and who make, uh, uh, you know, finding all these faculties from all around India as well as outside uh, possible. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank uh, our convener, Dr. Uh, Supraneshwar Rao, uh, whose brainchild this is and uh, under whose uh, leadership, uh, at least I, uh, I've been able to conduct all this with his help only. Uh, our next topic is going to be on urinary bladder malignancies, which is on 25th August, same day, Thursday, same time, 7 p.m. Uh, see you there. Good night and thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Is Dr. Batra, have we logged out, uh, Shrijan? No, no. You want me to wait? No, no, no. Just, just you want to catch up with Dr. Batra? No, I, I just, made, <laughs> I just made sure that I've just made sure I've got his number. Dr. Arul, yeah. it was a pleasure to see you, sir. Thank pleasure you. Same here. Same here. Thank you. Sir, thank you, sir. Sandeep Kalsar. Sir, I have his previous number. Thank you.